Netherlands has seen a number of radicalized attacks in the past years. Our hearts has gone out, have gone out to our French friends, especially during the Paris attacks in 2015, in November 2015, and in Nice on Bastille Day of this year. Since November 2015, France has been under a state of emergency, and the French society has seen a number of drastic changes. Uh, France is now a police state, and with that came a very extensive and intrusive surveillance framework. And if we're looking at the upcoming French presidential election in uh, the spring of 2017, and the rising popularity of the far right, um, we see that there is a serious need for debate on privacy rights, freedom of expression, and also on France's own national motto, which is the center of the French democratic value system. Liberté, égalité, fraternité, and what about privacy? So today we have with us Agnes and Chris from La Quadrature de Net, and they will start uh, framing the debate with their questions. And we hope that you will have a chance to add to that after the talk. Please help me welcome Agnes and Chris. Hi everyone, thank you for uh, coming. It's a great honor to be here. Um, let's start with uh, something uh, fun. Um, actually, yesterday we kind of revamped at the whole talk. Um, maybe this title we should have changed it to something like, as we were talking so much about friends, uh, we should have told, um, called it like privacy baguette. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no further ado, let's start. So let's be, honest. let's be honest, things are quite bad in France for freedom. Uh, they are taking a bad direction and it's uh, actually not easy to know um, exactly where the line between this is fine and it's really bad is. Living every day in France, um, it's difficult to say if we have already drifted too far or from what we know people are suffering and liberties are under attack. But the very fact that um, we are here to talk about this is good news. We can still talk about democracy and challenge the power, so let's do it. So back in 2012, President Hollande has been elected. His program was, well, left-wing, but since the arrival of Manuel Valls as a prime minister in July 2014, it illustrated a security turn for the government. Since that, French government policies were strongly oriented towards more surveillance and more what they call security. Our goal is to inverse the trend, to document what is going on so we can remember. In our political world, where everything is buzzing, when the EU, in the US election, we are even speaking about a post-truth world, where memories, documentation, they are of utmost importance. A little bit like the pigs in Orwell's animal form, more and more politicians are playing with memories and changing their minds every two years. Well, it isn't new that people in position of power are trying to rewrite history. However, it's now more and more difficult to keep track of those changes, especially when, on a long-term basis, information is so quickly buried under a massive amount of other type of information. In this talk, we are uh, focused on French laws that have been adopted in the last past three years and that are infringing fundamental um, rights in France in the digital uh, area. Of course, liberté, égalité, fraternité, but also privacy, which is not in uh, the national motto, but it's still a fundamental right undermined. So there are two many laws that are lately causing our liberty to decrease at an alarming rate. Most of them have a strong impact on internet use, whether it's metadata gathering, surveillance or censorship. We can easily say that France is up to date to the most techniques of policing the internet. Instead of doing a review of uh, each law specifically um, that was adopted in the last past three years, we would like to focus on the consequences of these laws. Um, as France, as, uh, France uh, adopted very strong security measures even before 2015 um, and the terror attacks. 
So first of all, a problem on uh, data retention and access. Um, law, since, well, law enforcement and uh, administrative authority can have now a wider access to metadata retained by um, hosting providers and ISP for broad purposes, such as the defense of promotion um, and for the defense and the promotion of the fundamental, fundamental interest of France. So here um, we are uh, before, well, before the, um, the adoption of the surveillance uh, law in 2015, there were only few administrations that had access to intelligence techniques. This is the surveillance law result. And this slide, well, which shows all the administration services that have access to intelligence techniques, uh, which is lots of them. Um, this, and this slide is not up to date because uh, since it has been done, um, new administrations such as uh, penitentiary authorities um, have, been, have also access to those type of uh, techniques. Basically, those are the techniques that are allowed and that all those um, administrations have access to. So to, it's not very easy to read because it's a very, very big image. Uh, you can find it on our wiki. I have credits at the end of this presentation. You can okay, find the link. So basically, you have here the Minister of Defense uh, with all the few administration around, uh, the Minister of Interior around here, and uh, around there, the Minister of Finance, and now the Ministry of Justice with the penitentiary authorities have also access to uh, that type of technique. So what technique are we talking about? Those technique, well, they are what they were calling are legal. So they are not illegal because there's no law to prohibit them, but they were used without any legal safeguards. They intrude privacy and um, although there is an um, oversight urgency having to check on how those techniques are being used and implemented, it has no real power to forbid the use of it one of those techniques. Those tools gather well, analysis of encrypted communications, keyloggers, internet probes into the backbone of the network, IMC cultures, and so on and so on. Well, there is also very weak and complicated judicial redress to, be, so to protect citizens of that. As a matter of fact, all secret surveillance is difficult to prove and to attack them. It's public knowledge, although that several years, that from several years, the French secret services were carrying surveillance on the international submarine cables, illegal surveillance, with no public debate and no law. That's why it was illegal. Even though we had sufficient evidence that the system existed since 2008, the lawsuit brought to the Conseil d'État, the Supreme Administrative Court, was dismissed with no scrutiny. And, um, of course, now international communication are also intercepted, uh, but now with the law. Um, but still with uh, no judicial redress and no real oversight. And here, for example, the MEP, Sophie Invelt, uh, brought a court case before the Conseil d'État, the administrative, uh, Supreme Administrative Court, um, and this court case was also dismissed. Basically, on um, the slide is written that she asked and she tweeted, My surveillance friends, I request control procedure for the National Commission for the Control of Intelligence Technique, which the name in French is the CNCTR, uh, the, Na the Commission Nationale pour le Contrôle des Techniques de Renseignement. That was tweeted on 4th May 2016. Next consequences will censorship. With the terrorism law of 2014, France reinforced the offense of apology of terrorism, which is the glorification of terrorism act and terrorism uh, speech. This offense is even more sanctioned if committed online. Yeah, and here you have uh, the United Nations report um, on the use of uh, the internet for terrorism purposes. And it's uh, written that... Um, it's, it's specific, a part specific on, on, on apology of terrorism, which says that some intergovernmental and human rights mechanisms have expressed up that the concept of glorification of terrorism is sufficiently narrow and precise to serve as a ba basis for criminal sanctions compliant with the requirements of the principle of legality and the permissible limitations of the right to freedom of expression. So, 
This is important because this means that France, France does not comply with that notion and consider that anything in the scope of apology of terrorism is illegal. illegal. And, of course, with no definition, real definition of what, what is apology of terrorism. Um, the problem is it's not only in France because the EU directive for combating uh, terrorism, which is um, going to be adopted very soon at the EU level, um, is going ex in the exact uh, same way. And, um, and then it will be applied in all the countries, so still without definition of what is apology of terrorism. Um, we shall not forget that a key difficulty is to identify where the line of acceptability lies, because it varies greatly from country to country, depending on cultural and legal history. So, apology of terrorism won't be, this, won't, uh, be exactly the same in one country and in another one. So, and still, no definition in none of the countries. Speaking of numbers, as we are geeks and we like numbers, between 1994 and 2014, there have been 14 people sentenced for, with the offense of apology of terrorism. In 2015, so in one year, there has been 336 people sentenced uh, with that offense, considering that one third of the people that have been uh, uh, sentenced have been sentenced on the sole uh, offense of apology of terrorism. That means that people are getting sentenced for very serious sanctions for merely going on a website or posting a status on a social network. Now let's talk of, uh, about police powers. So, since November 2015 and the terrorist attacks in France, uh, France in, uh, is in under a state of emergency, uh, which is still ongoing. So. Um, this state of emergency has been extended already five times and it will last until July 2017. So it will be almost uh, two years and we don't know if it won't be extended again. Um, it could be, at least for the moment. Um, it's the state of emergency is an exceptional state of power that was uh, installed in France for the war in Algeria. Um, it gives exceptional powers to the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Defense, and uh, as it was shaped as a regime for war situations. Now it looks like it's getting less of exceptional. But there is more. This means that we are going to have to elect our next president in France under an exceptional state of power. It means that emergency is, going, is becoming the current state of affair. It's not a bug, it's a future. So, next uh, consequence is searches. Um, this is part of the police uh, powers, but it has very interesting things. So, after the declaration of state of emergency in November 2015, the police carried a very large number of house searches at any time of the day and any time of the night. Um, and also, considering that it was, those searches were done at the police discretion without any uh, control in how the search was carried. Speaking of numbers, after three months, there has been around 3,336 searches. The searches were not only on the things in the place, but as well on the content of the computers or other type of system. There has been various versions of the law that allows those type of searches. The first law adopted in November allowed uh, the police to, uh, to grab any type of data on your computer and any type of system connected to that computer. That, in that could be a remote system, considering it could be your cloud storage, your remote servers, or, well, the whole internet. Um, after that, the, um, the, super, the uh, Conseil, Constitutional Council, which is a uh, censored part of the law, and well, put some kind of safeguards, but again, when the law was put back in, uh, after the attack in Nice on Bastille Day, this, um, the, uh, the extent and the scope of gathering the data on the computer was, was again um, broadened. 
and that allowed to, uh, for example, take, uh, to keep and to retain any type of data that is considered as suspicious, but wasn't, um, wasn't linked to any type of offense. And that has been censured again uh, by the Constitutional Council in the past month. Yeah, so uh, next talk uh, about the house arrests and limitation of demonstrations as well. So along with uh, house searches, many people were uh, under house arrest. This measure was largely used during the COP21, which was the conference on climate change that uh, uh, was uh, held in Paris in December 2015. Um, to forbid the organization of demonstrations. So, protesters were receiving notice that they were not allowed to be present in certain areas of Paris during a certain time, and some of them received uh, three months or more um, house arrest. Basically, so, yeah. Yeah, basically, what a house arrest is, is that you have to be at your place during, well, at your home during uh, almost all the day because you have to go to the police station three times a day to say that you're here. So, for example, you have to go on 9 o'clock, 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. So you cannot really go to work, you cannot go anywhere. You have to stay in the same area. And then on the top of that, there are a lot of people from the Muslim community that have been targeted by the police and they have seen the house brutally searched along with a notice of for three or more months without any proven uh, or known offenses. On the sole fact that, well, they were Muslim and they might have been maybe in contact potentially with someone that has been in contact, that someone has been in contact, that someone has been in contact with something. Yeah. And on the top of all those measures that uh, are barely legitimate, France uh, requested derogations from the European Court of Human Rights. It means that France deliberately asked the permission to infringe human rights. The Article 15 allows for a country to ask for that kind of permission in case of war or great danger for the nation. But what we saw is that we have seen uh, during the, um, the COP21 and the heavy repression of some uh, of the protests against the labor bill in spring 2016, um, the state of emergency and the limitation and the derogations um, are, are not only used for anti-terrorism purposes and not only for great danger for the nations. French Fifth Republic is often called a presidential republic. This tendency is only confirmed by the adoption of the recent laws led to a real shift, strengthening the executive power at the expense of the, uh, the, ex the legislative and the judicial one. Sorry. <laughs> Let's remember that the separation of powers is a key principle for a democracy, as none of the parts of the power are perfect and they all need to be balanced by each other. Which is uh, written in the Declaration of Human and Civic Rights since 1789, um, a society in which the observance of the law is not assured nor the separation of powers defined has no constitution at all. So maybe we could say um, or ask whether France has a constitutional at all. A constitution, yeah. That was a slide from the previous version of this presentation, and that's the catalogue of all the laws we've been telling you about so far. It goes from uh, 2013, we decided to start on 2013 because otherwise it would have been a six-hour presentation. Um, but from the military planning law to the terrorism law, surveillance law, you have might have been heard about those laws uh, in the 32C3, the there have been a presentation on those laws, and after the extension of the state of emergency and the reform of the penal law that, in, that includes now in the common law measure from the state of emergency. Um, yeah. These laws uh, are only those who are related in a way or another to the digital uh, Issues. So there are some others on immigration, on several things. On a fun thing, at some point we were wondering if they were all trying to put terrorism in a law so they could go further. For example, I remember a law that was called uh, a law on transportation, uh, public transport and terrorism. 
So they had someone, we always try to be like, hey, do you want a sandwich? Yeah, I would like ham, cheese, and terrorism. <laughs> So, let's talk about privacy now. Privacy? Are you kidding? Have you thought of terrorists? This well, is a great illustration. <laughs> yeah. So, why privacy? Uh, because it's uh, increasingly something attacked in uh, all laws as, uh, in, Fran in France as something to limit or bypass in order to fight against terrorism. Um, more especially to protect uh, people from themselves or from the others but normal people, um, so. Yeah, but as soon as you weaken fundamental rights, you, um, I've lost my line. As soon, sorry. <laughs> as soon as you weaken fundamental rights, we weaken all other rights. The state of emergency regime is a perfect example of how the weakening of our rights and our liberties affect our societies. But privacy is a condition for us to exist and to think and to be ourselves. How to be free? if you don't know whether your thoughts are scanned by public or private actors. The Panopticon Society is being installed in a very insidious way, as self-censorship is going along with it. But there is more. In a society where Panopticon is uh, the norm, the only way to exert our liberties and to have some privacy is encryption. As you know, encryption is one of the key battles uh, for the next years, and um, Unfortunately, our politicians have well understood the issue and are trying to weaken or harm encryption. It's especially true in France, but probably not only. And uh, so, up to us to work um, for what we want and what believe it, we, we believe in. So, now we explain the situation. Let's go to what we can do. So, I really like this, citation, this quotation that says that be the change you want to see in the world. LQDN, well, La Quadrature, tries to do this in a very different way. First of all, there is one of the big work is advocacy. We did a lot of advocacy work on all those laws mentioned before, uh, but as France since, well, the few months, has started an electoral, electoral year, and as we know that politics are more communication than actual work, especially when an election is coming, it becomes almost impossible to follow and to explain the disaster to the member of parliament or to the government. They just reply, they have the responsibility to fight terrorism and so on and so on, and there is of course no other way to do this. When advocacy is not efficient anymore, we try to switch our strategy and, for example, document the future uh, for the future. So, for example, this is in French, but uh, this is one of the documents we uh, write to uh, try to explain how the uh, whole system of security is going on. Um, it's called Boulevard of the End of Liberties. We like very dramatic titles, are we are French. <laughs> um, it goes from 2014 uh, to 2016. Basically, it's everything you've seen until the, ref the um, penal law reform. Um, you can find it on our wiki. If you were interested to translate this, uh, come talk to us. That would be a fun idea. Um, furthermore, after that, in May 2016, we uh, really switched strategies. We decided to leave the state of emergency. Um, explain, for example, why uh, we understood that the fact that politicians were going on for communication and maybe to be elected, it was very hard to try to, for them to listen to us. Um, so why, right now, what La Quadrature is working, so mostly working on positive proposal and to increase our work towards the general public in order to, under, to help understand the major issues. Basically, we, try, we just took a tactical step back so we can go again more in the future. Please read the whole uh, press release, the URL is here. Um, we, that's only for France. We keep working at the European level on the same thing. And for example, also, but we don't disappear from the political landscape as we join other like-minded NGO to create a common platform to pro promote our proposals during the general election debate, but we're not really aiming them at any type of candidate. We're just saying that's the world we want. So, um... To hack our way around the limit of advocacy, uh, for two years we've been filing court cases against those laws. 
Um, this is joint effort with, made with two other uh, NGOs. Uh, the two of them are the FFDN, FF, FDN. So uh, FDN is a non-profit, the first one, is a non-profit ISP, the France, uh, France oldest internet access provider since 1992. And FFDN is a federation of non-profit ISPs. So gathering around 30 user-ported non-profit internet access providers, including FDN, and there is also one in Belgium, for example, so not only in France. Um, so this, uh, the nickname of the group is uh, the Exeget Amateur, so with a great translation in English. <laughs> um, it's a group of volunteering lawyers and geeks in France, using the system to fight the system, and uh, sometimes to lose against the system, and we try to win also, uh, sometimes. So the, the Exeget team is actually um, an informal and um, self-organized working group, so no, not a really NGO registered in France. Uh, they started um, the first lawsuits in early 2015 on uh, data retention, and then on state censorship and surveillance. And uh, for two years, they have launched 20 procedures, which is huge, no, knowing that they're all volunteers. I mean, they all are working, uh, they have normal work during the day, and they're working for the court case during the evening, the night, the weekend, and sometimes during their job time, probably, as well. Um, but don't tell them to their employer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we will, I will give a quick overview um, of, of, of their job, but I will try to make it simple because I'm, I'm not going to detail 20 procedures, which would be not possible. And uh, if you are interested in it, and there will be a self-organized session, but we will give the information at 4 p.m. today um, with some of the exegetes um, to talk about our litigation case, give more information, and also to coordinate litigation teams in Europe if some of you are involved in such uh, groups, because this is quite important, and we've already tried to start it, but uh, we feel that it would be great to, to go uh, more into it. So, first, uh, on data retention and access, the French military planning law uh, that was adopted in date 7, 2013, extended the way for the administrative bodies to get access to metadata, uh, retained by hosting providers and ISP, within a large and imprecise, imprecise scope for the defense and promotion of national interests, which is so very broad. Um, in fact, we started two court cases for this one. One more focused on data retention and data access in the framework of this specific military planning law. And one another on the whole existing framework for data retention. Um, and one of uh, our main arguments were that in 2014, the European Court of Justice had overturned the EU data retention provisions adopted in 2016, so one year, uh, 10 years ago, in a ruling called Digital Rights Island. So maybe some of you uh, already heard about it. So the first court case uh, focused on military planning law uh, was rejected by the Court of States, uh, by the Conseil d'État, the Supreme um, Administrative Court. We had asked for a preliminary ruling uh, to the Conseil d'État. The preliminary ruling is a question asked by a national judge to um, the European Court of Justice for interpreting, uh, for, well, we ask them to interpret uh, the European uh, laws, regulations, uh, the European ruling, and um, it enables a more, uh, a better uh, harmonized uh, implementation of the regulation, the European regulation in all the member states. Um, unfortunately, the Conseil d'État, uh, our court, did not even explain why they did not ask for the question, but they didn't ask for the question. And uh, fortunately, the good news is that other national courts, such as the Swedish one and the British one, um, 
are making it better than French ones. And I've, um, I've asked exactly the same question to the European Court of Justice on data retention. And the European Court of Justice replied last week on 21st of December, I think it was last week or the week before, that um, a general and indiscriminate data retention of so this Here is in bold, of all traffic and location data of all subscribers and registered users relating to all means of electronic communication was not compatible with the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. So that was what we were saying, and that was what the, con the Conseil d'État said, mm, you're wrong, or, and we, didn't, we won't explain you why you're wrong, or we will explain you but badly. Um, <laughs> So, this ruling is a very good news for us. We were kicked by the, out by the Conseil d'État, and the European Court of Justice just said we were right. Um, now, we hope that the Conseil d'État will take it into account for our second court case, the one of the, for the uh, more general framework of for data retention in France. So, we are impatient to know um, to see what will come out from this decision as the, uh, as the stakes are very high. Um, next part. Yeah, next part on surveillance law. So it started a long time ago when uh, probably some of you weren't born yet, well, in, yeah, in 1991. Um, after a ruling by the European Court of Human Rights that France was violating privacy rights. The French government enacted, um, so on, already on 1991, France was doing things uh, for infringing uh, human rights. Uh, so it's probably not very new. But um, so French government enacted uh, a law on surveillance to enable public authority to use surveillance techniques and control uh, uh, radio communication without any oversight of any independent entity for the defense of national interest. You know, national interests are always the most important, so we can do whatever we want and use whatever technique to control and to um, monitor uh, radio communications. So we challenge these provisions before the constitutional, uh, the, court, the Conseil Constitutionnel, which is the uh, constitutional uh, court, and succeeded in October, striking down the legal regime for the surveillance of uh, radio transmissions. Uh, so now they cannot uh, do like, they, like, like before and, and uh, make surveillance of radio transmission without any oversight, which was what they did before. Um, unfortunately, that's not all on surveillance. So we saw earlier that since the adoption of the surveillance law in, Juli in July 2015, the tools for intelligence services and other public bodies have been developed, the scope broadened, the oversight not strong enough, uh, but at the same time, the judicial remedy has not been enhanced. And uh, we have challenged all the implementing decrees, five of them, and we are still ongoing proceeding against the French government and the, uh, the Conseil d'État. So it's still ongoing. We're still waiting for the... Uh, I mean, no, we yes, you know, we, we sent uh, um, information to the court and, and the government replied and then we can reply and so, and so on until there is a decision. So it's still ongoing. So, and on censorship, which is the third uh, big uh, focus of the exegetes. So the terrorism law... Um, adopted in 2014, enables administrative body to block websites without prior judicial oversight, uh, without prior judicial redress, and without proven efficiency. So, uh, real censorship. So, France, France legal regime is even worse than Russia's website working legislation. Because in Russia, the blacklist is actually subject to public scrutiny. In France, the list is updated in secret uh, by the French police, and we cannot access it. Um, apparently, the only country in Europe doing as bad as France is Turkey. So, nice. <laughs> uh, 
Um, furthermore, when a page is censored, users that try to reach the page um, are automatically redirected to the Minister of Interior's web page, website, yeah. Uh, and when we challenged this, the Conseil d'État dismissed our argument, saying it was okay, because there, were, there was no processing of personal data, such as IP addresses, for example. Yeah. Yeah, yes, sure. Guess what happened? <laughs> A few weeks ago, uh, Orange, our historical uh, telecom um, operator, made a big mistake and locked IP addresses uh, of Google, Wikipedia, and other websites. So, big disorder for uh, all those who are using Orange's uh, DNS. And all the people were redirected to the Ministry of Interior's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they had fail. a page, well, the page uh, fall down at the end, but they had a page at the beginning saying that they had tried to reach a um, terrorist website. So, Google... <laughs> yeah. Google had become a, a terrorist website by a human mistake, which is quite interesting. And uh, the ministry has thus announced that the collect, uh, that data collected because of uh, this mistake wouldn't be processed. But he had said before that none, or well, the Conseil d'État had said before that none of the data were processed. So what? It seems that he's changed his mind between before the orange fail and after the one, the, the, the orange fail. So now we are getting back to the Conseil d'État with new evidence again. So that's it with, uh, with uh, the exegetes. And well, there will be more information and possib possibility to, to talk with them um, and with us. Uh, it will be at the error lounge. Yeah. It's on the fourth floor in front of all one. Uh, so it's like the place like with huge glasses and it's like very yeah. beautiful. Well, I think this is where you have the mannequins. Maybe. Yeah. It's well, in, uh, at 4 p.m. At 4 p.m. today. Just Fourth floor. To talk with the exegetes. Um, so there is, uh, aside those all legal uh, challenges and uh, legal work we're doing, which is in fact very, very interesting because sometimes when you have a huge website blocked, you have new information. Uh, one of the other means of La Quadrature is to uh, work with people and to help them to understand and reappropriate themselves the issues and or fight. The idea is so people can not only be part of fight, but to make their fight their own. So we can decentralize, we, can, we, can not, we are not the provider of how it should be. We have, as you know, every uh, CCC will talk about our tools and we have a lot of ongoing working tools and most of them are working and most of them are really awesome. Um, so MemoPol, which um, is a tool that allows to track the position of a representative over the time on a subject. So basically, so you will be able to know if your representative, what, uh, what he voted before and after this and that and that. And if he, for example, he changes his mind a lot or not. For example, um, also, uh, for example, we on our instance of Memopol, because Memopol can be decentralized and you can install your own instance, which is great. Um, we have people that voted for ACTA back in the days, and they voted for the surveillance law in France when they come back from the European um, administration to the French administration. So they have such a bad score, it's almost impossible. You know that this guy is such a bad dude. How is that possible? Well, there is, uh, this is a tool that is on free and lib open source software. Uh, it's on our Git, so please uh, check it up if you're, a, if you're a developer, if you like doing data work and so on. Uh, it's really, really interesting. The next tool uh, that we are uh, using is the PyPhone. We use it to contact freely our representative. The idea is that uh, people, when they're on an ongoing European campaign, for example, for the uh, European Parliament, how they're going to be able to contact the representative because, well, you know, phone charges. And when you have to do international phone, it's even more. Well, everyone should be able to participate into the public debate. That's, that means that you shouldn't be uh, worried about how much it costs you. So we build a tool that allows you to, to pay it freely, to connect your, uh, contact your representative freely. Um, it's a free, like, it's really free as in free beer and free as in freedom, as uh, you know. 
Uh, there is also on the GitLab. Um, please take a, uh, take a look on this. It's uh, it's fun. Uh, the other one that's um, a documentation. Uh, we were talking a lot about documentation before, and our wiki is used to document all our work, all our analysis, and that it was very very heavily used to prepare this conference, because trying to find back into uh, months and months of press release is more complicated, but when you have a wiki with all the information really well structured, it's important. Also, to, to note that um, during the first week of the state of emergency, um, that there is not on the slide because I just thought about this, but uh, people started to make a list of all the um, violation of uh, rights uh, during the house searches and during the house arrest. And our wiki page, when you go on the first page, you can find it very uh, quickly. There is a list of all press articles speaking about violation during the first weeks and first month of the state of emergency. This list is huge. Just for that. Wikis impo are important, people. Um, then you have Respect My Net. I don't know if some people were on the talk in a whole two on day one were picking about, uh, speaking about uh, net neutrality. And basically, Respect My Net, that also has a website, respectmynet.eu, uh, is a tool that allows to spot the violation of net neutrality. Um, I'll really go back to that conference. Um, and if you have questions, come say, come talk to me. And there are other things that are more part of the new strategy of La Quadrature. Now, crypto parties and the network of supporters. Well, crypto parties, um, you've been to some of them, you know what it is, um, and it's still really important, it's still relevant. Maybe the way that we were doing them is good, maybe we have to change our way of doing them. Nonetheless, sharing our experiences, sharing our knowledge, sharing our best practices, sharing our error, is making us a, best, a better community, is making me better tools. So we have to keep doing them, we are uh, working with people, trying to um, go back in new ideas on doing crypto parties, and so more than just the usual crypto party thing, key signing PGP, there are more to that. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about encryption and security here at the CCC and in the previous CCC as well, and I'm sure in the future one. So um, really people, talk to each other. And finally, the network of supporters, with, which is the core thing of what uh, we can do. The network of supporters, uh, like any type of NGO, is um, the people that are making living it that without the support of La Quadrature will be nothing. We'll just be uh, people in, a, in an office uh, working something. But when people speak about it, when people um, contact with it, um, we, have, um, we have the ability to decentralize our work and decentralize our communication. That makes us more resilient. Because if something falls there, well, the rest can work. That's the basis of the internet, decentralize everything. So that's it. We, we know we can do it, and we know we are already doing it, so let's keep doing this. Let's go back to our conclusion. I'm not here to really tell you what to do. Um, um, we are just presenting what we are doing here in France. But what's going on in your countries? You're all from different countries from the European Union, even, even overseas. So what laws are adopted in your country? Why? what type of uh, legislation is regulating surveillance? And what, for example, are you doing at that, about that? What about doing other litigation work? Let's join it in a huge European uh, litigation work and let's hack again the system because advocacy work, maybe we'll have to think about new ways to make our rights and to speak about the rights in the next years. So um, think of yourself, what, what are you doing? And we are really interested in knowing what you're doing. Let's get together, let's decentralize things, let's make uh, other types of uh, litigation work, other types of crypto parties, other types of tools that allow us to communicate, allow us to make our rights important and to um, connect and to participate in the public debate. Because, well, democracy is, uh, is alive because of the people. If the people are not alive, there is no democracy. So that's, that's it. You have the credits for most of, I think, everything I've put in the, uh, in the um, slides. Um, the extrajudicial access to the, so it's not metadata, it's techniques. Um, so, uh, so you have this on our wiki. The United Nations report on the use of internet for terms purposes, the icon. 
there is twice the same file. That's, that's great. I'll bring a big uh, shout out to Stormgate who made the file with the whole techniques and all administration. That was huge work. Uh, thank you very much to that. You have the database, the database on the French security law done by our uh, graphic designer, uh, Croix d'Agondin, and the privacy comic on that page. There's a lot of comics about privacy. Some of them are really, really funny. Go over there. Finally, if you have questions, contact us. Uh, website, we are on an ongoing uh, fundraising campaign as every year. We are around 70% of our budget. Um, if you're interested, please support us. And uh, thank you. And if you have questions, we're on to that. If you have questions uh, for Agnes and Chris, there are four uh, microphones on the sides. Please come to the microphone. We don't have so much time. So let's start right away with the microphone on this side, please. Yeah, I have a general question about the French situation. Uh, as far as terrorism is concerned, is there any debate whatsoever in France that that perhaps may have something to do with French colonialism in the past centuries? <laughs> No. <laughs> no, it's uh, on, on colonialism. It's um, it's well. I remember in the in the November twenty uh, twenty uh, last year in November, uh, French uh, French Prime Minister said Manuel Valls said something uh, very strong, and that's really uh, illustrated how French power were seeing terrorism, at least at that time. It was uh, explaining, it's already trying to f uh, for uh, for um, for forgive. Yes, that's a word. So explaining is trying to forgive. What, what does that mean about the understanding of such a complicated issue as what we're, uh, Europe is going through right now? So I guess the debate will happen. In the next years, there are people working on the anti rest in France. Um, big shout out to them. Uh, but so far, in the, the big uh, parliaments and so on, this debate is not really heard as French uh, politicians are very much on the hysterical um, reaction to, uh, to terrorism. It's like, ah, oh, this is crazy, we have to do something. Our, our values, our life model, lifestyle, everything is attacked. So, um, so far, the debates were not they're really one sided. Okay, then here in the front, please. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding the house rates you were talking about that were um, yeah, rising, especially within the Muslim community. And um, I think in Germany, too, there are lots of people who are referred uh, as suspects, although there is no reason and they are surveil surveyed all also. And I wanted to know if there is anything on a policy level or maybe from the civil society initiatives or organizations working against that. Okay. Um, not so far. The thing is that there have been few uh, court files and court cases on the house rights. Uh, the, what is interesting is that uh, they really rushed everything after the, uh, the attacks of November. And so th things are getting settled and first things are getting um, judged. And for example, there are people that are still under house arrest uh, since November, last week, yeah. last year. So this is like, we don't know, well, I guess in the future something will come up, but so far um, there are civil society working on that. Uh, Amnesty, but it's on, uh, Amnesty and the League of the Droits uh, Human, human rights, rights Watch. Well, yeah, no, not Human Rights Watch, but uh, Human Rights League or... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are working on that, yeah. Thank you. I don't know English, yeah. Then we have a question from the internet. Yes, uh, the IRC is asking basically two questions. First of all, Echo21 asks, you mentioned over 3,000 searches since the state of emergency was enacted. Do you know how many convictions for crimes these have resulted in? Yes, but I didn't, I forgot to put the numbers. <laughs> let, me, um, let me try to find it. You have my great wallpaper here. I hope this, okay, it's put here, great. Uh, I know I found the, the um, ah, those numbers are from the report on the first month. It's not since last year, that's the first month of a state of emergency. Um, and that the report was issued on the third month. Uh, what is this? Yep, 
So there was the French um, newspaper, uh, Le Monde has a section uh, called De the Decoders, and they try doing database on uh, numbers and so on. So basically, uh, it's very small, but you have 400, um, that was after three months, I think, if I remember well. Yeah. That was after on the report that are 400 house arrests, there are 290 still active. There has been 563 judicial procedure with 28 on terrorism, uh, 23 for apology of terrorism, uh, well, 28 uh, being linked to terrorism, and five real for terrorism. So that's very small. Uh, and um, there have been uh, the next numbers, I'm just reading that for the information, that is uh, 1,038 individuals that have been uh, followed by different secret services, the DGEC, which is the interior services, and among which 320 have been already uh, um, contacted. So, yeah. This has, this has been done in January 2016, so it was... A year ago, three months after the start of State of Emergency. Those numbers are outdated. Yeah. We have okay. no idea about the new one. Thank you for that. And the second uh, question is by Iktra Seal. Uh, he basically asks, in your eyes, how big is uh, the impact of the exigé amateur on the situation in France? Is it more than a voice to articulate disagreement with the status quo? You should, I think... Yeah, it's from internet, so I guess it's not. this person is not here right now. Uh, otherwise, I would have... I would tell them to go ask them. Uh, nonetheless, I think we are creating a lot of jurisprudence uh, that could be used from other countries in Europe or in the world uh, or in France uh, for that kind of issue. Yeah, I think uh, the influence, well, the, the impact of the exegete is uh, increasing um, time after time. I mean, like, um, and uh, I mean, now people are contacting us on Twitter to ask us to uh, challenge a new law or change anything that, that are coming and, and that is not great. So, I mean, I think that there is something that is, uh, you know... Growing. Uh, yeah. We, the the exit amateur has been ongoing since two years only, so that's very, very young. Okay, then the microphone in the back there, please. Hi. Um, I... Could you talk a little bit more about the role litigation has had in activism and creating political change, um, especially if you have any examples about your experience with it? Um, you mean that it, yeah, the impact of litigation in, in activism? Yeah. I think it's very important just because uh, right now we feel that advocacy in France, at least, advocacy is not... Um, uh, enough to change things, so you fight uh, as you can against, for example, for surveillance uh, law in 2015, we fought a lot, we were, uh, La Quadrature was at the top of uh, world leader in the fighting against this law, and uh, finally we, uh, we lost because it was adopted, and uh, even, though, even though on that we, we created a huge coalition of, where are you? <laughs> uh, we create a huge coalition uh, with private actors, private companies, startups, uh, also with uh, NGO for, for human rights and other type of, uh, of right, general civil rights. The coalition was huge, also individuals. I mean, there have been lawyers, very known and top lawyers, to try signing against that. And the government was deaf to that. So maybe, if it's not working, let's hack our way around that. Yeah, and, and then... It's, it's important to us to have other solutions afterwards to fight against. And it, uh, it enables other people to participate because some of the people would, would not be able or would not like to do some advocacy but can help to do some litigation. Uh, it enables also to um, collaborate, cooperate with other uh, NGOs doing the same thing on litigation other, uh, in other countries. Uh, and to create new, new, uh, new, new links, new, yeah, new networks. Um, so it's, I think it's, it's complementary and it's very important to keep going with it because, and, and, and it's an, also when you cannot find a way to, um, for example, for data retention, there is, there was no way for us to win at, well, to, to make it uh, fall down uh, uh, on the French uh, level, 
either by, by um, advocacy or by French uh, challenges or court cases. And uh, it's at the European Union level that we can um, finally um, succeed. So it's very important to, I mean, to... Um, try everything. Yeah, to try all, all the tools we have to, um, to succeed to it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Then up here in the front, please. Yeah, in my opinion, uh, calling the state of emergency is a slight overreaction on the topic. Uh, but what is the uh, uh, public opinion in France to, on this? How are the people uh, seeing, viewing that uh, a state of emergency being called right now and extended every here and then? First of all, the state of emergency is not a name of us. That's the name of the actual state. It's called it urgence. It's from a law from the 1955. On the public opinion, it has been changing a lot. Um, I think, considering public opinion, it's really complicated. As um, public opinion, it depends where you pick it. Do you pick it from your friends? Do you pick it from uh, a study? Uh, do you pick it from general what media are saying? So what happens is that also they, they see the relation with the general reaction. And I think it's, it, you can link it with the shock strategy defined in Naomi's Klein book. So after the attacks, of course, everyone was trying, we want more security. But we can see that even as France adopted an anti terrorism law every year for the past 20 years, 25 years, we have still those problems. And there is something that politicians try to advocate that they will fix things. However, we know, as we are geeks, hackers and so on, that perfect security is impossible. So on the public opinion, I think there is a, we are living a, 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 a turmoil. Now on one side, you have the rise of populist leaders such as Marine Le Pen. On the other side, you have left-wing parties going full security. And uh, the politic applied by Manuel Valls wasn't a, a left-wing politics, such so a strong right-wing politics that could have been done by any kind of repu hardcore Republican. So I think we are in a time of a change, and we have to decide what do we believe in, what world do we want, and what do we want to do that world. And I, I would just add um, something, uh, which is even if people uh, get used to the state of emergency, get used to be search uh, the bags at, at uh, each time you go in a shop, get used to, uh, you know, uh, have to show your bags to take the train or anything like this, uh, and to have uh, less uh, freedoms on the internet or less freedoms any, anyhow. Um, I mean, they're getting used to be in a more... Um, what, to lose their freedom, uh, you know, and um, and this is absolutely not what we want. So we try to oppose this. That's it. Thank you. Then um, the internet again, please. Um, we had a huge uh, feedback on Twitter and of course many people are asking, is this a blueprint for other countries as well? But uh, Puri Kion in IRC is especially asking, what is the current state of affairs in Belgium? Oh. Do you know something about that? <laughs> um, the, I know Belgium has have adopted few security laws. Uh, for having been in, I mean, I, I don't have such an in-depth knowledge about Belgium legislation on that. Uh, nonetheless, I think Belgium is less drama, drama queen about that. I'd say that like this. Uh, <laughs> um, they have have been in Brussels just after the the attacks in Brussels, and the, the reaction between Paris and Brussels was very very different. Um, Belgium has other type of issue, for example, also that they have this far right wing uh, political party, uh, racist political party at the power. So that's um, not a type of problem. So um, I would say go ask NURPA, which is the Net User Right Protection uh, Organization in Belgium. So maybe go ask them, they may know more than me. Thanks. And then over here, please. I may refer back to Belgium because I live in Brussels, so I've seen the situation. I think it's uh, good because the government is already chaotic enough, so they cannot really take stance on this. And the only comment they made so far was blaming PlayStation for encryption and <laughs> communication among terrorists. 
That was the Minister of Interior, complete bullshit. But coming back to uh, France, uh, what's the, uh, do you have any allies among um, public figures or any political parties, maybe not parties, but politicians who voice your concerns and your calls? What's the state of the public debate? And do you foresee that after the elections, in case for national wins, can it go any worse? I'm not asking that question. I will not ask that question. <laughs> and can get any worse? I mean, the second part. On the first part, we have politicians that are... Uh... Yeah, yeah, that are for supporting us a little bit, yeah, uh, or, or a lot, uh, but few of them. I mean, um, especially the member of parliament. Well, uh, right now we have a socialist government, you know, uh, the government is socialist one, but it's an extreme right one as well. So depending uh, the official name or the right uh, situation. Um, so uh, among the socialists, among the left wings, we have uh, support in the green side or depending on, yeah, we have a little bit, but... Um, among the member of parliament, I mean, it's very few of them. And especially on terrorism issue, they've, they're told each time they have to vote something that they would be responsible if they do not vote the law. So they do not want to be responsible of the next attack so that they vote the law. So, I mean, the support is not so uh, strong. And the, the government is using a very, that's very part of the new f Prime Minister of France, Bernard Cazeneuve, uh, that has a very way of saying, uh, say, telling people that they should vote what he's giving, that uh, if you don't vote, first you are against France, you are against French values, and you will be responsible for the next attack. So, as a polit politician, what does that mean? Well, you have your job, your job is being, that is chosen by the people, and you have to do that. And after, you are scared that people are going to tell you that's your fault. So, you kind of vote the same way he says. Okay, we have time for one more brief question. That goes to you. So, the EU seems to be helping you guys a bit. I mean, you're saying, you know, you go over the French courts and to the EU courts, and it's nice that the EU is at least in something a force for good, but how long will that last? I mean, there are a lot of other countries that are pushing the EU in a, well, fascist direction, to put it that way. <laughs> I mean, how long will this be helpful? Um... It depends. Uh, for example, what we talk about the EU Court of Justice uh, that helps uh, us for data retention, for example. Um, it's not always the case. For example, the, terrorism, the directive on combating terrorism that is uh, currently negotiated uh, at the EU level um, and will be adopted by the EU Parliament in January or beginning of February probably, is not very good and lots of French measures for terrorism law uh, are uh, put into this directive. So um, EU is not always helping us, um, but it's interesting for us to work with the EU because uh, um, you go out from your French, um, French uh, very uh, close, you know, mind, you know, um, from the government and, uh, and members of parliament. So right now, this is not always the EU that helps uh, help us, but uh, not all the part of the EU, but especially the court. Um, and honestly, we do not know how long it would last. And we hope uh, it could uh, help us to uh, keep going this way, but, you know, uh, otherwise, if for the other people here who have questions, uh, come see us at the tea house uh, afterwards and for the talk of the exeget at 4 p.m. What time is that again? 4 p.m. At 4 p.m. and fourth, fourth floor. 4 p.m. Fourth floor. Yeah. Great. That's easy. In Thank front of all one. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>